we've seen a dramatic increase in the creativity of people. People are freed to think about the conceptual issues involved and the creative issues involved. And one of the things that made Apple great was that in the early days, it was built from the heart. The people that have really made the contributions have been the thinkers and the doers. You know, when I walked out the door at Apple, we had a 10-year lead on everybody else in the industry. We watched Microsoft take 10 years to catch up with it. The reason that they could catch up with it was because Apple stood still. What is there left for you to do now that you're 25 and the company's gone public? Steve Jobs was one of the greatest visionaries this world has ever seen. Regardless of your thoughts or feelings on Apple as a company today, there's no denying the impact Steve Jobs has had on the modern world. There may be no man who has both directly and indirectly changed as much as Jobs. From the first personal computer as we think of it today, to the graphical user interface and the mouse, to the iPod, iPhone, and iPad. As much as Jobs was already seen as a revolutionary in the 1980s, and with the success and brilliance of the Apple 1 and 2, when it came to the Lisa and the Macintosh, the positive reception and clear innovation didn't directly translate to commercial success. In fact, both computers were major factors in the firing of Steve Jobs from his own company. Finally tonight, we focus on an Apple. Apple the computer, not the fruit. The once high-flying computer industry is having its troubles. Scully and Jobs say Apple's future is with personal computers for the business market. But nationwide sales of the Macintosh and the Apple II have been slow since the first of the year. Many dealers are stuck with big inventories, both in the warehouse and on their shelves. In 1983, Jobs was young, rich, and seen as undisciplined by the investors and Apple board. He wanted to be CEO, but was denied the position. And so Jobs would bring in what would turn out to be his own demise in the then CEO of PepsiCo, John Scully. The legendary pitch from Jobs to Scully was said as, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? With a quote like that, it's not as if Scully had much choice but to join Apple and take the reins as CEO. Jobs was not a perfect man. Far from it. In fact, he was very flawed and had a reputation of being difficult to work with and extremely stubborn. He's been criticized to no end over the years. Less so now that his legacy has come to fulfillment and he's passed away, but Jobs suffered through constant detractors over the years and comments saying that he simply piggybacked off the innovations of others. Steve Wozniak did the main engineering behind the Apple One, Jobs simply sold the computer, and so on and so forth. However, as it often is, the truth is much more complex than that. Jobs was brilliant. He was and what Waz saw in a hobby, a side project, Jobs saw in the future of computing. He had a vision, and it's that vision that would bring about a change in the world and society that's only been seen on the same scale maybe a few times prior. Jobs knew that the pricing of the Macintosh was going to hold it back, and according to John Scully, after a showdown regarding this point, Jobs would voluntarily leave Apple then and there. Jobs told a different story, one where he was outright fired from Apple that day, and I would wager that was likely closer to the the truth. And so Jobs was forced to leave the company he founded in his father's garage, and Scully would lead Apple to what would initially be success. At first, Apple didn't feel any different from the revolutionary company they had been. They continued making the innovations and changes you would expect from Apple, bringing color displays to Mac, making laptops with a power book. But what Scully lacked was a vision of the future, and there was a full absence of any true next step happening. The Newton was probably the most interesting device that would come under Scully's reign, being a essentially a precursor to modern tablets that was supposed to recognize handwriting. But in practice, the device was awful, didn't really work, and the technology just wasn't where it needed to be yet. So after the Newton, and also the expensive switch to PowerPC architecture, something that wasn't as economically viable as Intel's platform, Scully was fired. Longtime Apple employee Michael Spindler would take his place, and he would last a full three years before being replaced in 1996 after acquisition talks fell through with IBM, Sun Microsystems, and Philips. Gil Elmio came in to replace Spindler in 96, and would make immediate moves to acquire Nex, the computer company that Jobs had founded after being ousted by Apple. The company had made technically impressive and powerful computers, but they were expensive and not selling particularly well. Elmio saw the potential in getting the technology, as well as Jobs, back, and while this move ultimately would save Apple from the brink of dissolution, it would also be Elmio's own undoing. The June of 1997, an anonymous party 
Harry sold 1.5 million Apple shares all at once, causing the stock to drop to an all-time low. And that weekend, Jobs would convince the board to name him interim CEO and fire Emilio. The man who sold that stock was Steve Jobs. The stock hitting that all-time low likely played a huge part in the board listening to Jobs' proposal, and there's no question that while the move was sketchy on Jobs' part, it does make for a pretty great story. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mistakes we made, some people will be pissed off, some people will not know what they're talking about, but it's, I think it is so much better than where things were not very long ago. And I think we're going to get there. I think Apple has a lot to contribute still. And I think the computer industry is still very young, and I think Apple's the company that's made great technology really easy and really approachable for people. And I think the world would be a, 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 you know, a slightly worse off place without Apple Computer. And he's back, folks. To quickly clarify here, in order to give some more background leading up to the launch of the iPod, we are going to take a little bit more time. That being said, we will be going through every single iPod ever made throughout the 20 year history. I'll have timestamps linked in the description, and if you'd like to skip ahead, feel free to do so. Personally, I find the entire history of Steve Jobs and Apple just so fascinating, I couldn't avoid talking about it today. And with this video being posted on the 20th anniversary of iPod, I thought it was appropriate. So back to, as I was saying, the former formerly disgraced Steve Jobs had returned to the company he himself had started. Jobs, now officially interim CEO, would immediately make changes to save Apple, as they were on the brink of demise and had just cut a third of their workforce. Jobs would later go on to say that they were only about 90 days away from bankruptcy, but this was a man that, as his surname would imply, was up to the job. He would terminate a number of projects he saw as both unnecessary and unprofitable. This included the failed Newton, as well as the CyberDoc suite which had a number of open dock based internet applications for Mac, including a web browser, email, newsreader, and so on. Open dock, the software framework these apps had been built on, was also discontinued, which, while somewhat controversial among those still dedicated to Apple, would prove to be the right move. Note that Apple had spent years developing these applications only for jobs to get rid of them not long after they finally released. It was purported that employees were afraid of seeing jobs in the elevator, with the concern that their projects and their livelihood might be the next on the chopping block. Another big aspect of Apple that Jobs axed was the licensing system for Macintosh clones. Though little known, Apple had a very short-lived licensing program for Mac OS 7 that allowed computer companies to purchase compatible motherboards or build their own hardware with licensed reference designs. And then they could use Mac OS 7. Essentially, Apple was allowing other companies to build their own Macs. Kind of the equivalent of a Hackintosh today, except completely official, legal, and being sold by genuine companies. These weren't terribly common, as macOS ran on PowerPC over Intel, which was a completely different architecture and required the separate hardware, but there were still a number of PCs made from early 1995 until Jobs had his way around mid-1997. Power Computing and UMacs were the biggest Mac clone makers. Apple would buy out the core assets of Power Computing, but interestingly, they actually let UMacs continue selling their own computers, as they focused on the low-end sub-thousand dollar offerings, particularly with within East Asian markets, areas where Apple struggled. UMAX still had that license for Mac OS 8, but it would expire the July of 1998, and UMAX would then shift its focus to selling scanners instead of personal computers. Just an obscure, kind of interesting piece of Apple history. All in all, there were a total of 75 Macintosh clones made, at least that are known of, including a few from Motorola. Beyond these changes, Joms would also bring in a new board and work on making peace with his old rival and CEO of the now absolutely huge Microsoft. Bill Gates. Gates and Microsoft would invest $150 million into Apple, essentially saving the company. Ironically enough, though, with Jobs at the helm, I have little question that he would have been able to steer the company to success with or without Gates' help. The crowd booed Gates when he appeared on screen, but Jobs would say they needed all the help they could get. And it's true, it's really difficult to fully establish just how dire Apple's financial situation truly was. Back in 97, Apple was kind of seen like Blackberry is today, a company that had previous success and then did all it could to ride on it forever, even though time and technology just kept moving on. Sure, Blackberry still exists today, but can you name anything they've been doing lately? It was similar for Apple. It was so bad that the Dell CEO and founder, Michael Dell, would say that if he was in Jobs' shoes, he'd shut the company down and give the money back to the shareholders. But as we very well all know, Jobs was able to completely and utterly revitalize Apple on a level never seen before nor since. Aided by the aforementioned moves, along with him discovering the brilliant 
brilliance of Johnny Ive and beginning to work with him to develop actually finally well-designed computers. Away from the gray and beige of the past two decades and into the future, color, color, and more color was coming in the form of the iMac. And suddenly, Apple was relevant again. This is iMac. This is iMac, the whole thing is translucent, you can see into it, it's so cool. This is incredible compared to anything else out there, it looks like it's from another planet. 1998 was the year of iMac, a computer unlike any other that had ever come before. It had an appeal broader than just the office. It was cool, it was fun, it was iMac. Specifically, it's now known as the iMac G3. The G3 title coming from the PowerPC G3 processor that Apple was using at the time. The computer shipped with Mac OS 8.1, we weren't quite to the Mac OS 10 days yet, and the iMac was all in one, hearkening back to the original Macintosh. The internals of the machine were all stacked behind the 15 inch CRT display. And Apple wouldn't end the strangeness there. Unlike practically any and every computer, the iMac G3 featured a wide array of colors and translucent plastic, making the internals fully visible from the outside to the user. This was huge for the time. Don't forget that those tempered glass windows that your gaming PC might have wasn't a thing in 1998. Computer manufacturers were still marketing mainly to the office. In the office, you don't want things looking too unique or to stand out because you have a lot of people and usually a pretty small area, everything is official, it's uniform. And when they did try to appeal to the home, their whole idea was to make the computer look as unassuming and as subtle as possible. People thought of computers as these very abstract machines, a tool, and an expensive one at that, so it shouldn't look like a toy. But Jobs and Johnny Ive flipped that whole concept on its head, and the world of design is much better for it, even if Apple would move on from the look quite quickly as time moved on. The iMac also radically changed the way computers were used. Used. This was 1998, and at that time there were still a number of peripheral ports that were always included on computers. But if the iMac was supposed to be simple and easy and just supposed to connect to the internet, then condensing the complicated nature of how to connect things to your computer was a very smart way to make things simple, even if this wouldn't be popular among certain subsets of users. So the iMac would abandon previous Macintosh peripherals, along with a truly controversial omission with no floppy drive. Many were not happy about that. That was was a big deal at the time, but Apple would argue that compact disks, networks, and the internet were making the format obsolete. And they were right. And they were also right to move to what would prove to be the future with two USB ports. USB still being a relatively new form of connectivity. The keyboard also had two USB ports on it itself, which gave even more options for connecting things to the computer. The emission of the floppy drive could be easily compared to similar moves made in recent years, but that would be skipping ahead, and I suppose we're not really here just to talk about every every single little move from Apple. While the iMac was giving Apple an actual platform and modicum of relevance once more, they were still not nearly as successful or as known as they had once been or would be in the future. The computers were cool, but competing with Microsoft and Windows was no easy task, especially when there was a ridiculously huge amount of selection at an array of prices that would stretch significantly cheaper than Apple could ever sell any of their products for. Apple had never been anything more than Apple Computer, don't forget. This is what they were. They built computers, and that's all they did. If they wanted some form of dominance once more, Jobs knew they couldn't just build the best machines, and not even just the best experience, but they needed to give people a reason to buy them. The new look and naming scheme was all a part of this leap forward into the future, giving Macs, and especially that iMac, a sense of identity no other brand or computer had. Can you actually name another computer from around the year 2000? Jobs himself didn't actually come up with the title iMac. Originally, he was thinking along the lines of Mac Man, which seems amusingly bad in hindsight, though in all fairness, the shortening of Macintosh to Mac would end up sticking around in the naming schemes. An Apple executive within their ad agency suggested iMac, the I standing for internet, because the computer was meant to be so simple to get connected to the web. Apple has also stated that the I stands for innovation and individuality, but it doesn't really matter, as the I name would really come to stand for its own thing, a brand marker like no other to the point that the kids of Gen 
Gen Z, born from around 1998 and onwards, would be labeled the i generation. The first iMac was an absolute hit, and exactly what Apple needed to keep them afloat over the next couple years. 800,000 units were sold in the first five months of its existence, a number that Apple likely hadn't seen since the days of the Apple II. Clearly, this whole iMac branding was working, so Jobs wouldn't stop there. The next product to receive the i in its name would be the Apple iBook, releasing in 1999, one of the most unique-looking laptops ever made. It tried to recapture the iMac's design and form factor, but within the body of a laptop, and it certainly succeeded from a design angle. The colors, curvy looks, and upside-down Apple logo that would look right-side up to you when you closed the machine all gave an experience unlike any other in the extremely clunky, gray, and boring world of early laptops. As far as marketing goes, Jobs always loved to position Apple as the underdogs in the fight. Early Apple ads wouldn't hold back in attacking the corporate and plain attitude of IBM, with the 1984 ad of course being perhaps one of, if not the most iconic commercials ever to play on television, specifically being played during the 1984 Super Bowl. That ad was captivating and completely different from the norm of the 1980s. And with Jobs returning in 97, there was this kind of similar thought process of breaking the mediocrity of the status quo, and that would be the theme behind marketing with their new line of Think Different, the slogan they would feature in their ads. Particularly, there was that one ad campaign, and unfortunately I can't play it due to copyrighted material, but I'm sure you've seen the ad before. It goes, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pigs in the square holes. There was such an inspiring feel from these ads, that whole speech being written from Rob Siltonen and narrated originally by Richard Dreyfus, though there was also an ad spot with Jobs himself narrating. That one's probably more remembered looking back. This ad campaign involved these beautiful commercials featuring the greatest minds, heroes, and innovators of the 20th century. People like Nelson Mandela, Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King, Pablo Picasso, and Amelia Earhart. There was also a version that included comedian Jerry Seinfeld, which I thought was kind of funny, only airing once during the series finale of his own show, Seinfeld. The commercials all conveyed a feeling of purpose, of direction, of pride for the best humanity has ever had to offer, even if it was ultimately aimed to make you want to buy an Apple computer. But hey, advertisements are always aiming to sell you something. You might as well make it with an inspiring message, and that's exactly what Apple and Steve Jobs did. Jobs' involvement with the ad is a bit debated, but there's no question it perfectly fit his rebellious demeanor that he had shown so clearly over the past two decades. The ad campaign and Think Different slogan would be used from 1997 to 2002, and it's also thought to be a direct response to IBM's own longtime slogan, Think. That's it, just think. Jobs had also insisted on using the word different as a noun, not an adjective, rejecting the originally suggested think differently, and that makes sense. It wasn't think differently, it was think different. That different represented Apple as a brand and a company, one that had 180'd in a ridiculously short amount of time. The launch of iMac gave this sense of a new beginning, while also playing into that nostalgia element, which was huge, as those who had used a Macintosh back in the day would be in a position where they could afford and move back to an Apple computer had they gone to Windows. That introduction of the iMac featuring the phrase hello again on the display, it's just perfect. A direct callback to the first Macintosh writing out hello all the way back in 1984. In 1999, a year after the introduction of the iMac G3, Apple would officially drop the iconic rainbow logo, moving to the much more simple monochrome one we recognize today, along with this aqua-themed Apple logo that harkened to the iMac. It would be used in conjunction with the monochrome logo until around 2003. The rainbow technicolor theme was always very fun, but it was very 80s and 90s. He had the more modern design element of simplicity, quickly gaining ground at the turn of the century. While completely irrelevant to this video, I do just have to mention that while researching, I discovered that Steve Jobs was actually a board member of Gap. Yeah, that Gap, the clothing brand, and he served from 1999 to 2002. The man had his hand in so many cookie jars over his lifetime. Don't forget, he was also the pushing force behind computer animated films existing in the first place, with him co-founding Pixar, which would make the first full-length 3D computer animated film in Toy Story. But I digress. Besides the standout editions of the iMac and the iBook, Apple didn't have too many huge product releases from 97 to 2000. This whole pre-iPod era was very important in setting Apple up for the future. They needed all this to happen to put them in a place where they could take a risk with iPod. The Macworld Expo in 2000 would see John 
Jobs officially dropped the interim modifier from his title, now the full permanent CEO. Apple was building the foundation of what would become an entire ecosystem unlike any other. Steve Jobs had a vision, and as time kept ticking onwards, it would more and more come to fruition. Enough technology, usually from fairly diverse places, comes together and makes something that's a quantum leap forward possible. All of a sudden you start to sense things coming together and the planets lining up to where this is now possible. We see at Apple, one of the things we've always felt is that we want to stand at the intersection of, of technology and humanities. You know, the whole computer industry wants to forget about the humanist side and just focus on the technology. But we think there's a whole other side to the coin, which is what do you do with these things? And so that's, that's I think, what we do particularly well. And that's where we want to be. That is where we want to be. And we are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there. And that product is called iPod. I happen to have one right here in my pocket, my friend. There it is, right there. The turn of the millennium brought with it a multitude of changes in not only technology, but in society and the world at large. You can't look at the year of 2001 without thinking of 9-11, the thousands of lives lost, as well as the trust and optimism in the country of America itself. The ripple effects throughout society can still be felt today from that single event. The world was quickly changing, and it all set the stage for a technological revolution unseen and unheard of since the days of the Macintosh. You've all waited enough for this video to start talking about iPod. In the January of 2001, Apple would take the baby steps towards their musical revolution, though we wouldn't see the iPod itself quite yet. There is a music revolution happening right now. Now, music revolution is digital music on computers. Well, we're going to change all this today with something we call iTunes. <laughs> As I mentioned, we're late to this party and we're about to do a leapfrog. On January 9th, iTunes would launch a media player software for initially Mac only that was promotionally called the world's best and easiest to use jukebox software. iTunes itself had actually existed previously in a different form, with it being based around a program called Sound Jam MP that had been released in 1999. Apple purchased the program in 2000 and would simplify the UI along with adding the ability to burn CDs before packaging it into iTunes for originally Mac OS 9 only. We'll get to Mac OS 10, but it would come out that March and iTunes support would follow, even coming bundled with the OS. This was coming at a pivotal time for Apple, with them having just posted their first quarterly loss since Steve Jobs had rejoined the company at $195 million. Luckily, Jobs had about half a dozen aces up his sleeve to turn that around. Mac OS 10 would come out that March, and of course iTunes was bundled in. As Jobs had said, it's worth noting that Apple was a bit behind the pack here. Jukebox software seemed to be a dime a dozen, but what iTunes did was take all the best aspects of them and then combine them into one single simple to use application. It looked better and it was easier to use than pretty much any other option. If you actually watch the event, he talks about how bad media players were at the time. They would do things like throttle your disc writing speeds, trying to force you to pay money in order to unlock the full experience. At practice, that probably sounds kind of familiar to how a lot of things still work 20 years later, but iTunes was free. It changed changed everything, and the only thing that really held it back is that it was only on Mac. 98 had been a crucial year for Apple, and 2001 was shaping up to be just as significant. And as it would turn out, even more so thanks to a certain MP3 player coming October. Although even without that, I think you could debate 2001 was more important than 98, as Apple made one of the biggest leap forwards in software the tech industry has ever seen, as they went from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10, which is kind of what we're still using today, just heavily revised and improved. As you would expect, Mac OS 9 was the ninth major release of Apple's own operating system, with it directly descending from their very first one that came with the original Macintosh, at the time simply called System 1. Mac OS wasn't actually called Mac OS until around the time Steve Jobs came back to Apple, with 1991's System 7 being the main operating system all the way until 97 when Mac OS 8 came out. Mac OS 8 on its own was a really big update, as you would expect given it took six years, significantly modernizing the experience 
and bringing Apple roughly on par with what you'd expect from Windows around the same time. I didn't use computers in the 90s. I'm sure there were lots of pros to Windows and probably some pros to Mac as well. But regardless, Apple was saving their best new features for a few years down the road. Mac OS 8 would sell 1.2 million copies in the first two weeks, which was huge at a time when Apple was barely treading water, as we've thoroughly established. Mac OS 9 would come out two years later in 1999 and put an emphasis on internet capabilities, which made sense given how the i and Apple's now very popular iMac literally stood for internet. But the OS itself was very familiar in looks and function to Mac OS 8, with the main changes coming with Mac OS 10.0, or as you might remember it, Mac OS X, as it used the Roman numeral like a certain phone that would come much later. We've had that radical redesign when the iPhone jumped from iOS 6 to iOS 7, and we all remember how big a deal that was back in 2013, but that was nothing. This was Mac OS 9. Yeah, it looks old, very 80s, 90s. And then here's Mac OS 10.0, codenamed Cheetah. Not only does it look stunningly modern in comparison, but this general design called the Aqua interface is very much how Mac OS still looks today, 20 years later, albeit with it being much flatter and having a ton of different small changes in the aesthetic. But the dock at the bottom and the Apple menu on the top looks near identical to Mac OS Monterey, of course, the newest version. Sure, the dock and menu bar were technically also in classic Mac OS, but this just modernized it on an unprecedented level. Now, not only did computers look cool, but so did the software they ran. And Apple was quickly reestablishing their brand reputation of being fashionable with the help of all these new releases. Along with the new OS would be a suite of new applications that we would come to know as iLife. These included iMovie, iPhoto, and iDVD, all very useful apps, although there was a notable lack of anything to do with music, which is, of course, where iTunes ended up coming into the picture. Jobs had a vision of turning Macs into to this perfect digital hub, creating an ecosystem all centered around Mac. If that sounds familiar, it should, because Apple's mindset is pretty darn similar today. And Apple didn't stop here. The May of 2001, Steve Jobs would announce that Apple would be opening a number of retail stores across the United States, where they would of course sell Apple computers, but also various other tech products. What kind of products, you ask? Well, you know, pretty typical stuff, like digital cameras and camcorders, and you know, maybe also MP3 players. It was around this time that Apple would discuss continue the Power Mac G4 Cube, something that is only loosely relevant to the story, but I want to mention it because it's one of my favorite computer designs ever made. It looked amazing, announced July 2000, but it was a commercial failure, selling only 150,000 units over the first year until it was scrapped. This Mac was really one of Jobs' only failures when he came back, though reportedly he was pretty unhappy when he heard what it was going to sell for, and it's too bad because it was a gorgeous machine, but it was expensive for not a whole lot of power. That's the downside of having so little space to work with in a time where many computers like this weren't really much of a thing yet, at least not nearly like what we have today. Of course, it would be inspiration for the future Mac Mini though, and it would set a precedent for a bit more thanks to the addition of capacitive touch. You could touch the power button, which didn't push in or anything, and the cube would just magically turn on. This was the first time Apple used this tech, and uh, it'll come into play yet again just a little later. Also in May, the new iBook was unveiled, backtracking from the crazy clamshell design to a much more recognized Apple-like aesthetic with it being cased simply in white polycarbonate plastic. Apple more and more over time would really move to this, and we'll see that shortly. That month, the first ever retail store for Apple also launched in McLean, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., and this little video here is actually Jobs touring the place, which is a neat piece of history. Still though, as a consumer, it might have felt a little bit weird to see a store just dedicated to, like, a single computer. Well, a single brand of computers. Sure, it's cool and nice to be able to see the Macs in person and on display and try them out, but lots of stores would have already had that, and then lots of other computers to try. What people didn't know quite yet is that Apple was beginning to move into a different industry altogether, and one that would start small but quickly overtake anything and everything they had ever done before. I started the company with Steve Wozniak in my parents' garage, you know, 20 years ago. So there's a definite place in my heart for this. Uh, I'm drawing a salary of, I think, a dollar per year. I very much want to see Apple get turned around, and I think it's gonna. iPod. Development on the project began only two years after the Newton project was cut by Steve Jobs. This was around the time in the late 90s that digital music was absolutely blowing up, particularly thanks to a new file format called MP3. You may have heard of it. It rose to the top of formats in terms of relevance due to its small storage size and stellar audio quality. This made digital music widely accessible, and it also created the boom of illegal file sharing sites, ones dedicated to music such as the very popular 
Napster. However, even with piracy being an issue, MP3s were clearly going to be the standard format moving on. In 1999, Steve Jobs would discover the untapped potential of Firewire, an interface not unlike USB that had been developed in the late 80s and into the early 90s by Apple. At the end of the century, they began including it on their computers, and it would actually be used all the way up until 2011 when Thunderbolt would become the new standard for Apple. Early on, Firewire had some significant advantages over USB, the biggest one being faster transfer speeds and a speed that was unmitigated by CPU load, meaning consistently you would get more optimal performance. It was held especially in high regard by those working with video and audio, and armed with this information, Jobs had them added to Macs, thinking it would be perfect for people moving video over from their camcorders, where they could then edit a video on iMovie. Everything was supposed to connect, he was creating this ecosystem, and while it was certainly a very early form of it, it eventually would come to fruition. Both the rise in the music industry, it was clear Apple needed a music player, which is why, of course, they bought SoundJam MP and would release iTunes early 2001. But throughout the whole process, Steve Jobs and his team was finding that the current market of portable music players, including MP3 players, tended to be, um, not my words, crap. The issue is there was no real practical implementation of a portable player yet, with there basically being four options that Jobs would lay out in his presentation. The era of Walkman was essentially over, leaving portable CD players, which were big and required, well, CDs. These CDs, with their uncompressed audio, only holding about 15 songs. There were players that utilized flash memory, but with the tech in its infancy, they would only hold about 15 songs as well, just in a nicer form factor. Then there was also MP3 CD players, which could hold more songs than typical CDs because of MP3, but they were more expensive and he still had the issue of using a big, awkward machine with a CD spinning inside it for only about 150 songs. The best option may have been players that used actual hard drives, at least in theory, but they were big, they were clunky, the user interfaces were garbage and horrible to navigate. They also would connect to your computer via USB 1.1, which had absolutely awful speeds and would take forever when it came to transferring files. With iTunes on its way and seeing that the current market provided zero good options, Jobs decided to have Apple focus on the creation of its own MP3 player, and one that worked in conjunction with their own software, which would ideally lead to more customers to the Mac platform. John Rubenstein was the senior VP of hardware and was set to the task of making it happen. It was around this time, near the end of February, Steve Jobs and Rubenstein just happened to be in Japan for Macworld Tokyo. Rubenstein would go to what was simply a routine meeting with Toshiba, as they were a large supplier for Apple in making components, and near the end of his visit, he was shown this intriguing new hard drive, one that was only 1.8 inches in diameter, much smaller than the 2.5 inch hard drive that was being used in current iterations of those portable jukebox players. Toshiba had developed this drive, but actually had no idea what it could be used for. They were thinking maybe they could put it in a camera. This was a huge leap forward in technology, but they really needed someone to connect the dots to give a usefulness for it. And as soon as Rubenstein saw it, he did just that, telling Jobs when he went back to the hotel that he knew exactly how to build Apple's MP3 player, and he only needed one thing to do it, a $10 million check. Just normal stuff you would ask for from your boss, I think. Steve Jobs would give the go-ahead on the condition that the device needed to be ready to be sold for Christmas that year, which only gave really until August due to the preparation needed for marketing and, of course, the announcement. Six months to develop the best, most revolutionary music player ever made. Ah, no problem, right? Well, as it so happens, this wasn't exactly a small task, and it would require many man-hours to make it happen. But Apple employees were swamped with various projects, meaning that Rubenstein had to turn to outside help. And it just so happens, he was recommended just the man for the job. Tony Fidel was a former executive from Philips that had launched his own startup in the late 90s. And he was working on a similar project that would utilize a hard drive and an MP3 stereo player. He had been pitching his ideas to multiple companies, but was rejected repeatedly, until John Rubenstein gave him a call while he was on a ski lift in Colorado, telling him he couldn't tell him what the project was yet, but he wanted to meet him. And this was Apple. So his interest peaked, Fidel went to see him. Fidel was somewhat skeptical of the entire project, but he needed the money. So he took the offer of an eight-week contract to essentially come up with everything and anything that would be needed and how it would be done. At the end, he would report to Jobs, and report he did. He had eventually come up with a simple design that formed a rectangle that could fit in your pocket. There was a couple other ideas, but they weren't as good, and this is the one that would get Jobs excited. The progress was compounded with Phil Schiller coming in with this idea of the scroll wheel, which made it easy to move through the interface by only spinning the wheel in the center of the device. The idea was come up with when Schiller was researching competing MP3 players and getting frustrated by the navigation system. You would have to hit these arrow buttons over 
and over, but with a wheel, you don't need to press anything. It was extremely easy and intuitive, which was perfect for such a device from Apple. At the end of it all, we would get the iPod we all know and love today. Through the whole process of development, Jobs had been reported to, and he kept pushing the device to be simple and focused. Don't do too much with it. This is a music device and that's it. That's actually why there's no off button, for example. Simply press any button and it turns on, something that was unheard of in design, at least when it came to the vast majority of devices. And if you do need to fully shut it down, you could hold down the play pause button. The iPod's overall design was of course come up with by Johnny Ive, who made it look like many of Apple's other upcoming products with the white plastic. There's also this clear coat layer above it, which you can see when holding the iPod sideways. It's quite something. The casing as a whole was made up of only two pieces, that front piece and then the stainless steel back. Stainless steel on the back was perhaps an odd decision. It looked absolutely beautiful right out of the box, but it scratched and dented so easily and was also quite heavy. But it was thin and it was strong and it's what was chosen. And now, of course, it's hard to imagine iPod without it as it's become an absolutely iconic design element. Holding the iPod in hand exactly 20 years later is so cool. This is a device that was just brilliantly designed in a time where portable music players were pretty much hot garbage. This one is so good that I can honestly use it today without much issue. It's thick and a bit chunky, but not by any huge margin over many of the later iPods to come out, and it's still nowhere near big enough or heavy enough to be uncomfortable. It fits in both the hand and the pocket. That said, looking even somewhat closely certainly reveals the age. For one thing on the back under the Apple logo is the iPod wordmark, and in the old font Apple used called Garamond before switching to Myriad, making this the only iPod to ever have this. It's really cool, just something you don't see on any newer devices. It feels so out of place to see this on a device that came out in 2001. On the top of the iPod, there are two ports and a single switch. That would be the hold slider, which when showing red makes it so the iPod won't react to any inputs on the device. This is perfect for when you're putting the iPod in your pocket. As similar to pocket dialing on phones, it would have been very easy to make accidental presses. In the center is the headphone jack, of course, a long used standard of the music industry that would surely never die. And to the left of it is the Firewire port, specifically Firewire 400, which is different from Firewire 800, which requires a different kind of adapter and would come later. There's nothing on the bottom of the iPod, and the front is where things, of course, get quite interesting. The huge scroll wheels and buttons surrounding it in a circular shape is so brilliant and so nice to use. It was honestly the best design I think they could have come up with with the technology they had at the time, and the scroll wheel is just so darn satisfying to mess with. This is the only iPod that had an actual physically spinning scroll wheel. The rest of them don't move around like this, and while it makes sense to move on from it from a durability standpoint, I absolutely love messing with it, and I wish it had stuck around for a bit longer. That display shows the age perhaps better than any other aspect besides the old font on the back. It's a monochrome LCD similar to the old Game Boys from the 90s, meaning that to be able to see what was on the screen, you either needed to be in a well-lit area, or you could turn on the backlight for a short while to help with visibility. But what's on the display feels about as good as ever, being an extremely simple to use operating system that's navigated by scrolling. The battery life had been rated to last 10 hours, which was pretty good for a player from 2001, especially given how many songs it could hold, and initially there was only a single storage option, 5 gigabytes, which is what I have here. March 2002, a 10 gigabyte model would come out, costing $499. The 5 gig model had cost $399, which wasn't exactly cheap. According to the internet, $399 in 2001 adjusts to about $620 bucks 20 years later. Maybe that doesn't sound unreasonable, given how expensive phones are now, but around this time, portable music was pretty crappy, but it was at least affordable. The iPod costing so much money comparatively put a damper on what was clearly going to be a stellar product, and this effect was worse when it was revealed that the iPod was incompatible with Windows computers. You needed a Mac, and in particular iTunes, to be able to sync the device in the first place. And without that, you'd essentially have a very pretty paperweight. There was an immediate uproar from critics, bemoaning the prices, Mac-only connectivity, and even the size. Many felt that the device was big and chunky, though they probably didn't understand the advantages it came with. Sure, comparing it to flash storage-based MP3 players, those would have been much smaller and much more portable, but they would also probably hold around 64 megabytes of storage. Compare that to 5 gigs and suddenly this size doesn't seem so bad. Around this time lots of things were still coming out, but none were as promising as the iPod. iPod was always a go big or go home type product. It was pricey, but it was also so far ahead of everything else in the industry that I don't think it was even apparent just how much better it actually was, even if the price seemed hefty at first glance. $400 for a music player, are you nuts? And those reactions were reflected by the sales, which seemed low given the absolute absolutely legendary legacy 
this iPod has in tech history. 125,000 iPods were sold by the end of 2001. Not a small number to be sure, but considering the scale of iPod's eventual sale numbers, it sure seems that way. If you were one of those who were skeptical and decided to wait on it, you probably actually made the right decision because it wouldn't take too long for the already great iPod to get even better, with the second generation being announced under a year later on July 17th, 2002. From the front, the iPod 2 looked nearly identical to the first generation, but it actually changed up quite a few elements in order to just refine the experience. The top of the device now was included in the stainless steel casing, whereas before it was kind of plastic on the top. The second gen also had the hold slider, yet slightly bigger and easier to toggle, and the firewire port now had a cover. The bottom of the device is still void of any buttons or ports, and on the back of the iPod everything looks the same except we now have that more modern Apple font. But back to the front. The screen didn't change, being the same Game Boy style monochrome with of course the backlight. The scroll wheel, on the other hand, may look just slightly different. It's subtle, but it's a bit flatter on the second gen, more sunken in. And that's because it's not really so much a scroll wheel anymore as it is a touch wheel. If you remember, I took the time to mention the capacitive touch power button on the Power Mac G4 Cube, and that's exactly what the wheel is here. It's touch sensitive, it reacts to your finger turning around it, but it physically doesn't move at all, unlike the first gen, which actually spins. This was pretty darn cool tech for the time. Out of all the fairly incremental changes, the most important the second generation brought was Windows support, bundling the iPod with the software application called Music Match, which Apple partnered with to allow you to manage your iPod music library from your PC. This was such a necessary change to make, as before you were really just out of luck if you didn't have a Mac. While Jobs had hoped that the iPod would lead to more Mac sales, and it might have, what I think mostly happened is it just caused less iPod sales. Now if you already had a Mac, sure, maybe you would go out and buy the already pretty expensive iPod, but if you didn't have a Mac, not only do you have to go out and buy an expensive iPod, you also have to buy a much more expensive computer just to use the iPod. Not hard to see the problem, and Windows support fixed all this. Though in all fairness, at this point a Firewire connection was required, and that wasn't terribly common for PCs. Apple would continue selling the first gen iPod with the 5GB capacity for a reduced price of $300, so there was a decent budget option for those who wanted to save at least a little bit of money. At $399 you would get the second second generation with 10 gigabytes, and then there was also a 20 gig model for $499. A nice little storage bump across the board, and it meant even more songs in your pocket if a thousand wasn't enough for you. And if it wasn't, or you were getting bored with iPod in general, you wouldn't need to wait long for something better. Get your iPod. iPod's here. I sell iPods at Dodger games. Two, and then you gotta pass them down, kind of the way they sell hot dogs. I've got about 1500 in the trunk of my car. I'm usually shirtless. Just for effect, the money just starts flowing in. You can listen to all these songs. I say at least over 50 songs. I'm not quite sure the amount. I think it's like 2 million songs. My name is Will Ferrell, and I'm a porn actor. On April 29th, 2003, Apple announced a completely redesigned iPod, being the most drastic revamp yet. It is also without a doubt the least iPod-y looking iPod of the bunch, and it's pretty clear why from the get-go, with the buttons no longer being attached to the wheel, but instead being above it, separated completely, just below the display. This was due to Apple fully moving over to the touch capacitive technology. These buttons don't push in whatsoever, just react to your touch. They are slightly sunk into the plastic, so you can still feel where the buttons are without looking at the device, but it's definitely different. And I'm not really sure how I feel about it. It was controversial. It's interesting in the very least, but it doesn't really feel like an iPod design, in my opinion. The rest of the iPod, though, will feel more familiar, with a now rounded off edge around the device, which was a lot nicer than the sharp edges of the first two iPods. From the back, the iPod looked the same, although it was quite a bit thinner now. I do really love these stainless steel backs. It's nice to have a consistent design element across every iPod classic Apple made. I feel like that's not very common when it comes to most generations of any tech product. The top of the device will look a bit different, as there's no firewire port. The hold slider has gotten quite a bit thinner, and of course, there is a headphone jack, as well as this very small little port as well. This was for wired remote connectors. Previously on iPod, there was this little metal ring around the headphone jack, whereas here, they made it separate altogether. It's a bit funky. The iPod remote itself had actually been introduced with the second gen iPod, and came with the higher capacity models. It would plug into the 
headphone jack, and then it also had a headphone jack on the device itself, so you could pass through the audio. Eventually, it would be available to buy on its own. Certainly a uh, very weird piece of Apple tech that I did not know existed until researching for this video, and being very confused on what this little port was for. So there's no Firewire port, and turning to the bottom of the device, we find out exactly why, with a port that should probably look pretty familiar. That's right, 2003 marks the introduction of the first 30-pin connector in Apple's lineup, the same one they would use in their flagship portable devices for nearly a full decade. A big reason for it was the included dock. Now you could simply plop the iPod down and it would be able to charge and sync to your computer easier than ever. You could also connect the dock via USB, which exponentially expanded the number of compatible PCs as again, Firewire hadn't been too common. Turning back to the front of the device, those buttons are actually fully backlit in this kind of like pinky orangey color, which I really like. While the design, as I said, isn't one that feels terribly like an iPod to me, I still really do like it and it feels like kind of the perfect iPod to be an in-between for the original designs and the upcoming newer ones. My only real complaint is there's no tactile feedback. You press it and nothing happens, there's no click. It works, but it's not satisfying. The lineup now had a 10 gigabyte iPod third generation for $299, 15 gigs for $399, and 30 gigs for $499. And 30 gigs could hold approximately 7,500 songs, 7.5 times what was possible only a year and a half prior. The starting price of $300 was a major factor in pushing the iPod towards the mainstream. That wasn't so unreasonable, though the true upgrade from all this really had nothing to do with the iPod itself, but instead what came along with it. iTunes. We've had incredible success with this. Over 20 million copies of iTunes has been distributed. Today, we've got 200,000 tracks. We're loading in tracks every single day. This is going to keep on growing and growing and growing. And all of this music with all of these rights, you can buy for 99 cents per song with no subscription fee. The iTunes Music Store. Finally, there is an easy to use, comprehensive, condensed, and uncomplicated storefront to find practically any song and purchase it outright for the crazy fair price of 99 cents per track or $10 per album. This was long before the days of Spotify. So these prices weren't crazy at all, and even today they're still similar if you actually purchase music from the iTunes Store instead of streaming it off, say, Apple Music. One week into the iTunes Music Store being online with its massive library of 200,000 songs, Apple sold a million songs. One single week. There was only one problem. iTunes was still Mac only. And this feature, a lot of people thought we would never add until this happened. <laughs> Today we are announcing that the second generation iTunes doesn't just run on the Mac, but it runs on Windows too. iTunes for Windows is probably the best Windows app ever written. When we set our mind to something, we go all out. <laughs> and you will see that when you experience it. September 2003, Apple announced that it had sold 10 million songs through the iTunes store already, and a month later that October, the iTunes application and music store came to Windows. Music match support was phased out, and from this point onwards, the iPod just couldn't be stopped. The era of Apple from 2001 to 2003 was a massive turning point in the company's history. Yeah, another one. You can definitely bring it down to certain years where it seems like the tech world would change forever. But truly not since the Macintosh had any single product seemingly had such an impact in such a short amount of time on the tech industry, even if it didn't quite feel like it. After all, Apple's success with the iPod would directly lead to the iPhone. And iPod did something different. It didn't just affect the tech world. It also massively affected another industry, the music industry. iTunes and the iTunes Store is commonly given credit for basically killing physical music retailers as they used to exist. And I think while it would have happened inevitably with mp3 files on the rise, it's true that iTunes was kind of a catalyst for them becoming much less common over time. It was a massive change, and I don't think anyone would have seen Apple, of all companies, as being the ones to change the music industry forever. Don't forget, they were on the verge of bankruptcy when Steve Jobs came in in 1997. They went from that to leading the charge in digital music and changing the world yet again. Apple did what Apple does best, enter a market 
market that already existed, but then they went ahead and made something so far ahead of the game, there was just no contest. And all in all, this was the first era of iPod. From 2001 to 2003, we only saw those three iPod releases, and the users of iPod were thrilled with the device, seeing how quickly it became this iconic piece in pop culture. Having an iPod was cool, it was fashionable, having those Apple earbuds sticking in your ears was kind of a status symbol, and Apple was only just getting started, with iPods in their infancy prepared to take their next leap forward over the next few years. No longer was Apple computer solely about computers, and they had never been more successful than they were because of it. In California's Silicon Valley, time seems to be compressed, and Apple is a perfect example. My hope is, in our lifetimes, we can make a tool of a new kind, of an interactive kind. You're already seeing it in society now. People are becoming more and more familiar with interacting with intelligent electronic devices. That's changing things culturally. It's a step along the way. Two thousand four to two thousand six was the golden age of iPod, or the glory days, if you prefer. A time where iPod had already been successfully established, and there was nowhere for Apple to go but up. And to be sure, there was a cost to it. There was this magical charm and creativity Apple had to their computers, coming at the beginning of the Steve Jobs Renaissance. They seemed willing to experiment with the colorful iMac, the clamshell iBook, the G4 Cube, even that next iMac with its gorgeous lamp-like design. But when iPod hit, Apple knew they had found their golden ticket, and they didn't hesitate to punch it, unifying their lineup in glossy white polycarbonate, such as in the second iBook I showed, all matching the theme of their breakthrough product, iPod. And they made the right choice of going all in, with a full million iPods being sold by the June of 2003. While this was big for Apple, so was the iTunes store, absolutely killing it with 25 million songs sold in the first eight months. iPod had essentially managed to create its own market, one completely focused on portable music, and in doing so, had also been guaranteed a monopoly on it. MP3 players didn't exist so much as iPod existed. To many, MP3 players were known as just simply cheap knockoffs. Apple had positioned themselves perfectly, and 2004 would prove to be their biggest year yet, and by a long shot. But even if 2004 was going to be their biggest year so far, the next iPod release would prove to be the smallest. Perhaps even you could say mini. And so let's take a look at this. It's got 16 times the storage, it holds 16 times the music, it's half the thickness, and it's 50 bucks more. You get 940 more songs for $50. So the iPod mini, what's it look like? Well, this is the iPod and it's pretty small, but this is the mini, it's even smaller and it's pretty stunning. The iPod Mini was the first variation of the classic iPod, coming off the heels of Toshiba announcing that it had created a hard drive half the size of the one that had been used in the iPod, meaning theoretically it would be possible for Apple to genuinely compete with the flash storage players that still were prevalent in the market, those of course being lighter and smaller, and that's exactly what would happen. With the iPod Mini being announced the January of 2004, albeit with a Hitachi drive the same size as that new Toshiba drive and a capacity of 4 gigabytes. This was a significantly higher capacity than flash-based players, and it was at the fairly reasonable price of $250. There was more to the iPod mini than first met the eye, though what met the eye was pretty great too. iPod was finally colorful, matching those dancing commercials that had quickly become iconic, with the options of silver, blue, green, pink, and gold. I myself of course have the gold one here, and it's funnily reminiscent of the gold iPhone 5s to me. except you know, it came out nine years earlier. The colors were cool, but they weren't exactly revolutionary. What was, beyond I guess the hard drive, was the redesigned click wheel. Something so brilliant and simple and cutting edge that it would forever be remembered as the symbol of iPod as a whole. The click wheel took the touch sensitivity of the third generation and fixed my big two complaints with that device. I didn't like that the buttons have moved, and I also didn't like the lack of tactile feedback upon pushing the buttons. But this scroll wheel not only could be scrolled like normal, but it could also be clicked, pushing down along the sides, triggering the function labeled similar to the first and second iPods, but this time it was on the wheel itself. The click wheel would stick around permanently until touchscreens had basically taken over, and for good reason, with it being a simple, satisfying, and convenient method of navigating through your entire music library. The rest of the iPod mini may have been smaller than previous models, but it was otherwise pretty similar to the third generation. The bottom of the device had the same 30-pin connector, which allowed 
mount for both the USB and Firewire connections. The top had the headphone jack, that remote control port again, and the hold toggle, nothing too crazy. Turning back to the front, that small display is exactly like previous ones, being monochrome and having a backlight for when it was needed. Battery life for this iPod was about the same as the third generation at eight hours. This was a great device, and it felt significantly better than the iPod third generation in a good few ways. And the only real downside was that it just had a smaller storage capacity. So not to be upstaged by themselves, on July 19th, 2004, Apple would officially announce their next generation iPod, the fourth generation, and the first of what I would consider to be the more modern era when it came to design. The click wheel was here, along with initially two storage options, 20 or 40 gigabytes coming in at 299 or 399 respectively. The battery remained the same from the third gen, but the components were much more energy efficient, so you had 12 hours of life, a pretty substantial improvement. On the top of the device, again, we have the hold toggle, headphone jack, and remote control port. And on the bottom, the 30 pin charging port that can now be used with Firewire or USB without the dock as a middleman. This was all in all a pretty decent upgrade, but we still had that same monochrome display that was really starting to feel dated. Luckily, Apple wouldn't wait long to fix this. The iPod Photo was next in the line of iPods to come out, unveiled not long after the fourth generation at the end of October 2004. As the suffix photo would imply, the iPod supported common photo file formats such as JPEG and PNG that could be transferred over through iTunes, while also bringing the first color LCD on iPod and a higher resolution on the 2-inch screen going from 160 by 128 to 220 by 176. This, with the backlight, made for an absolutely gorgeous display given the time period, and being able to show photos off on any kind of portable device was practically unheard of, beyond, I guess, actual laptops or cell phones that actually had cameras, as well as, you know, actual digital cameras. The iPod Photo came in 40 or 60 gigs at 499 and 599, and the monochrome iPod 4th Gen would still be sold alongside it. This was a genuinely separate model, at least in the beginning, and it had to have been at least a little bit confusing for consumers at the time why the 4th Gen wasn't just this new iPod Photo in the first place. At the beginning of 2004, there was only one iPod with the 3rd Gen, and by the end, there were three iPods. The 4th Gen iPod, the iPod Photo, and of course, the iPod Mini. Oh, and there was also an extremely obscure product you may never have heard of, the HP iPod. These are a bit rare, being discontinued mid-2005, but basically Hewlett Packard in early 2004 announced a deal with iPod where iPods would be sold by HP with HP's own branding. And when I say branding, I mean this little logo on the back. And while originally there was supposed to be a blue color, that doesn't seem to have ever happened. They sold an iPod Mini, iPod Photo, and even iPod Shuffle, which we'll get to shortly, and apparently despite being identical to regular iPods, Apple wouldn't repair them at their stores, which is just funny and totally Apple and just so needlessly semantic. Regardless, just an interesting tidbit, and hey, why not throw another one in while we're at it? Actually, this one is a bit more significant, maybe? When the iPod Photo was announced, the October of 2004, there was also a special edition unveiled, specifically the first U2 special edition iPod. It featured a full black plastic front and red wheel, along with the signatures of the band members etched onto the back of the device. There would be multiple renditions of the U2 iPod over the years, across different generations, and this was the first mainline iPod to deviate from the white plastic device. However, this wasn't the iPod photo. It was identical to the fourth generation, and used the old display, but still costed $50 more than the standard iPod, with a few U2 bonuses thrown in. A cool pickup for fans of the band, and those who are a fan of that beautiful red and black color scheme. Unfortunately, there was one more event in 2004 we should probably mention. It was the first time that Steve Jobs' health issues would become public. He had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2003, and August 2004 chose to email the employees of Apple, informing them of his condition. He had, however, undergone a successful operation to remove it. Great news at the time from the man who deserves so much of the credit for Apple's sudden success. 2004 marked a point where iPod was more appealing than ever, having a smaller version that was cheaper, with more personality and the colors in the iPod Mini. The fourth generation brought the click wheel and even more storage for the price. The iPod Photo brought that beautiful colorful display. The iTunes Music Store was the only genuinely good way to buy music online and avoid resorting to illegal downloads, and it was so much better than any other route before it. And with iTunes being on Windows now, there was an absolutely massive number of new potential buyers for iPod, as they wouldn't have to go get an expensive Macintosh in order to use the digital sensation. They also could go and check out the device for themselves at one of Apple's new retail locations, places that no doubt were much busier
easier now thanks to the hot new device. Actor Will Smith was quoted in 2004 saying that the iPod was the gadget of the century. A bold claim to be sure, and it's clear he had no idea of the behemoth that was only a few years away. But for the time being, 2004 was the year of iPod, with Apple finishing it off by selling their 10th million iPod, with 4.5 million of them being sold the holiday quarter alone and 8.2 million in the whole of 2004. Remember June 2003, they had sold their millionth iPod? If you thought 2004 was busy, you'd be right, but Apple knew to make hay while the sun shines, and they weren't slowing down come 2005, getting things started off with a bang that January. And so today, we are introducing the iPod Shuffle, and this is what it looks like. It's unbelievable. The iPod Shuffle was Apple's first foray into flash-based storage. It kind of looks like an oversized stick of gum, or perhaps a flash drive. And if you thought that, you'd be more correct than you might expect. The cap at the bottom here is removable, revealing a USB connector, which can be plugged straight into your computer for charging and syncing the device. You can even set aside some internal storage to be used as an actual flash drive, which is hilarious, and in hindsight, could have been genuinely useful for users in 2005, even if now it doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of storage available. And there wasn't comparatively to the rest of the iPod lineup, but it didn't really need to have any more, coming in at either 512 megabytes or a single gigabyte. As the name would suggest, the iPod Shuffle wasn't really meant to carry your whole music library per se. Apple had noticed that the Shuffle feature on iPod was a very popular way of listening, and so they felt like it made sense to build a device around it. And that Shuffle was very successful thanks to the small form factor, as well as the small price tag as it started at $99. The design of the shuffle was pretty out there considering the iPods that had come before it, and when the cap is on, it kind of looks like a small TV remote. And the cap, there's actually a lanyard attachment, which Jobs wore on stage when talking about the device, and I actually have it here. It's pretty cool and convenient. This was the iPod for people on the go, perfect for going on a run or to the gym, with a number of accessories being introduced, such as a waterproof case and an armband. Back to the design again, we don't have the click wheel, and we don't have any display. Just a play pause button, volume up and volume down, and skip forward and skip back. Considering you can only put so many songs on here within one playlist, that's really all you need. Sure, it might be super annoying to find a single specific song, but that's not what the shuffle was for. If you wanted to show off your library, a proper iPod would be the way to go. The headphone jack is on the top of the device, and on the back, you have this big slider with three basic options, off, on loop, or on shuffle. Underneath is an indicator for the battery, that was rated to last 12 hours, and that's about it. Plain, simple, and budget-oriented. The shuffle was a fantastic move on Apple's part, yet again unlocking an entire base of customers that wouldn't have ever been able to afford an iPod otherwise. $99 was genuinely achievable for most people, and the sales reflected that, with this generation's peak having 100,000 units produced per day, which is just insane. Apple fans would have to wait an entire excruciating month before the next Apple event, featuring a minor revisement to the storage options of the normal iPod, as well as the addition of the second generation iPod mini, being very similar to the first generation, but more refined. There was now a six gigabyte model, along with the four gig, and the battery life had been extended to 18 hours from the eight of the first mini. Design-wise, the new one looked essentially the same, with the second mini now having brighter color options and dropping the gold altogether as it wasn't particularly popular. If it helps, I like it. For the second mini here, I have green, and you'll notice that the icons on the click wheel are now colored to match the color of the device. Just a really nice touch. This was an altogether pretty basic update, and sadly the last one we'd ever see to the iPod mini line. It's interesting because every other iPod Apple made has at least a few models, but not the mini, and we'll be finding out why pretty shortly here. This device still has some life today though, as enthusiasts really do enjoy it, and it's pretty common to see projects loading it up with higher capacity flash storage, just like people do with iPod classics. And battery replacements, especially for the first first iPod mini have always been pretty common modifications. There's even some kind of form of jailbreaking for the iPod, and it's just really cool to see a whole community come together to enjoy this product that Apple left in the dust so soon. While the iPod mini would be missed, it did represent the first time Apple stepped out of their comfort zone with iPod, not only making a new type of iPod altogether, but actually giving color options, something that they had shied away from in their recent years. June 2005, Apple finally made some changes to the iPod line that they 
they probably should have done the year prior. The iPod Photo was merged with the regular iPod. The 30 gig model they had was dropped, and the 20 gig iPod was given that color display, hence why it would often be referred to as iPod Color. There were only 20 and 60 gig options at this point, as well as another U2 edition iPod that was also given the color display, but still only had 20 gigs. And yet, these would all be discontinued that October. But first, another iPod was announced in September, yeah. Well, now we're gonna replace the iPod Mini with a new player, an entirely new ground up design, and it's called the iPod Nano. The iPod Nano is the biggest revolution since the original iPod. Now this pocket's been the one that your iPod's gone in, traditionally. The iPod and the iPod mini fit great in there. You ever wonder what this pocket's for? <laughs> I've always wondered that. Well now we know, because this is the new iPod Nano. say goodbye to the iPod mini that like just got a new model, we have the iPod Nano now. The iPod Nano completely replaced the mini in Apple's lineup and it used flash storage, thus being able to get significantly smaller, lighter, and just all around better. It had a full color display and initially came in two or four gigabytes, being 200 or $250. And then there was a single gigabyte option added in 06 for 150. And flash storage is of course faster than a physical hard drive. The design here was simple, being long and thin, with the classic stainless steel backing that hadn't been on the iPod mini, as well as a plastic flat front plate and the click wheel. There was only two colors in white or black, and the iPod Nano, sure enough, would be an instant success. It was small, it was more affordable, it had that color screen. However, not all was perfect with the Nano. The plastic is infamous for scratching absurdly easily, to the point that there was a class action lawsuit against Apple in 2005. And believe it or not, Apple would actually eventually relent in 2010. Yeah, five years later. And we're we're not talking about the iPod scratching when you stuck it in your pocket with your keys. Apparently it was claimed that even a microfiber cloth could scratch them. Apple would settle, promising $15 to $25 for each person, depending on whether or not the user had received the protective slipcase when the device was purchased. That may not sound like a lot of money, and you're right, uh, but as a lump sum, Apple had paid $22.5 million, certainly chump change for them, but a pretty penny all the same. The gift that keeps on giving, there was also an eventual recall of the iPod Nano, affecting those sold from the September of 2005 to December 2006. This was due to a battery overheating issue, and that recall was issued November 11th, 2011, which is kind of hilariously late. The iPod Nano might be the only memorable part of that event, but it doesn't mean that it was the only thing that happened. There was also the announcement of the first ever iPhone, um, sorry, <laughs> the first iTunes compatible cell phone, the Motorola Roker. This phone was an absolute disaster from the get-go, and Jobs apparently was furious with how it turned out even before he went on stage to talk about it. We won't cover it today because this video is already way too long as it is, but maybe we'll look at it in a future video because it's a pretty fascinating story. And with that out of the way, only one more event remained. The fifth generation iPod, also known as the iPod Video, would be announced October 12, 2005. It featured yet another redesign, refining the fourth generation's look with its click wheel and moving back to the flat front, having that glossy plastic. For the first time, there was now a new color in black, and the iPod was absolutely gorgeous. Plastic does have its drawbacks, and like the Nano, the front does scratch pretty easily, but it still looks fantastic in my opinion, and in the very least, there's no question it was the ultimate iPod design of all that had been seen thus far. The top of the iPod showed the four-pin remote port was now gone, with the classic hold toggle and the headphone jack, of course, remaining, now on opposite sides near the corners. The bottom holds the 30-pin connector again. It was also significantly thinner and lighter than the fourth generation with even more storage and actually smaller click wheel as well. The fifth generation's display was also larger at 2.5 inches with a resolution of 320 by 240. A very good number for a device like this and very much an appealing feature. As said, this generation is often referred to as the iPod video and that's because it introduced video playback for the first time. While this screen is tiny in retrospect, it was one of the best money could buy and being able to purchase movies and shows off iTunes right where you also 
buy your music was yet just another step in the ever-evolving Apple ecosystem experience. The 30 gig model was $299 and the 60 was $399. There wasn't a U2 edition quite yet, but it would come the next year. And so that wrapped up 2005, a big milestone year for iPod, but then again, pretty much every year at this point was a supposed milestone year for iPod. At Macworld Expo January 2006, Steve Jobs would state that Apple had sold 42 million iPods at this point, and 850 million songs had been bought through the iTunes Music Store. That's how fast iPods were flying off the shelves. The exponential growth had been absolutely ridiculous, and there weren't any signs of slowing down yet. That said, 2006 did seem to be a somewhat muted year for Apple, given the crazy amount of models that had come out the past two years. However, in September, there were a wide array of improvements across the board. And before we get to that, just a brief honorable mention here to the iPod Radio Remote, an accessory announced at that Macworld Expo, costing $50 and giving iPods the ability to receive FM radio signals. Just kind of neat and essentially the successor to that strange remote control we saw earlier on, but September 2006. If you've ever looked into the culture surrounding iPod repair and refurbishing, you've likely come across the legendary iPod 5.5 enhanced version. And that's what this was, being an internal improvement over the 2005 model that Apple didn't deem worthy of being a full generation newer. The screen got up to 60% brighter and the Samsung SoC was improved, making the device more powerful and allowing a search function to be added for the first time. Storage was also bumped up and prices were slashed by $50, putting the 30 gig iPod at $250 and the now 80 gig iPod at $350. And then of course, there was yet another U2 special edition iPod. Can't miss out on that and it's a beautiful red click wheel. The iPod 5.5 is extremely sought after in the iPod community. It has the same model number as the 2005 one, but you can distinguish if it's the newer one by checking to see if there's a search option available. The main reason this specific iPod is still so popular among enthusiasts is sound quality. It uses a Wolfson DAC, the last one to be in an iPod. The 2005 model also has that, but of course the other improvements with the enhanced model just make it that much better. All in all, it does feel a little bit silly to me that Apple didn't wait to add these things to a full new generation, but with tech moving so quickly, I will say it's quite cool of them to make sure at least they were offering the best possible products at an even cheaper price than they were before. They definitely didn't have to do that. Perhaps this was a response in the rise of competition they had been seeing, though ultimately not a lot would come of it. The Zune from Microsoft is probably the most remembered iPod competitor, and believe it or not, the first one didn't even come out until November 2006. I'm not going to get into Zune, I think it would be worthy of its own video, but Microsoft was just way too late to the party, as Apple had more than established themselves as the king of the portable music market. Also announced at this event was the new iPod Shuffle. The second generation was a complete overhaul, scrapping the 2005 design and making the device absurdly small in this little rectangular aluminum body with a clip on the back. And as Apple's tagline proclaimed, it was the most wearable iPod ever. Initially, the shuffle was extremely simple. There was only one option, being silver with a single gigabyte of storage, and that was about it. Apple claimed this was the world's smallest MP3 player, and I honestly believe at this point it probably was. It's tiny to the point that there's no 30-pin connector port. Instead, you would both charge and sync the iPod through the headphone jack. It was a bit strange, and not nearly as convenient as the first shuffle essentially just being a flash drive, but it more than made up for it with its super small size, and it actually still worked for file storage if you set it up that way. The second generation iPod Nano was a pretty big redesign, moving to aluminum to combat the scratching of the year prior, as well as a whole nice variety of colors that iPods had been sorely lacking since the iPod Mini. Aluminum was more and more becoming standard in the iPod line, and it certainly seemed like the way to go. It was durable, visually appealing, and could easily be given a variety of colors, of which the Nano had a good few depending on your storage capacity. The 2 gig model only came in silver, 4 gigs in green, blue, silver, or pink, and then 8 gigs in black. The display was more vibrant and 40% brighter. The battery got a huge upgrade, going from 14 to 24 hours, and you even got the search functionality added. A month later in October, the iPod Nano would get an all-new color, in fact being the first Product Red iPod. Product Red being an organization raising money to combat AIDS in Africa. Every purchase of a Product Red device has a portion of the profit going to the cause, a noble endeavor, and one that almost didn't happen. Apparently it took some convincing to get Jobs on board, as he didn't want to cheapen the brand name by having a whole bunch of different editions, but eventually it still ended up happening, and it exists today in a wide number of Apple products, including the last iPod, but we'll get to that. At the beginning of this chapter, starting at 2004, there was a single iPod, the iPod 3rd generation. By the end of 2006, there not only had been two generations of an iPod that was already discontinued, being of course the iPod mini, but you also had two more generations of the original 
original iPod, two generations of a new iPod in the shuffle, and then another two generations of another new iPod, the iPod Nano. And then of course, a ridiculous amount of minor revisions along the way. Apple was taking full advantage of their success with the iPod brand, and customers were eating it up, with there now being a device for anyone and everyone. Apple computers' main selling point was no longer computers, and anyone who still even remotely doubted them may have finally been shut up the January of 2006, when Steve Jobs would send out an email to his employees. Team, it turned out that Michael Dell wasn't perfect at predicting the future. Based on today's stock market close, Apple is worth more than Dell. Stocks go up and down, and things may be different tomorrow, but I thought it was worth a moment of reflection today. Steve. This simple message perfectly showed the personality and character of Steve Jobs, a man who was so driven, brilliant, and endlessly ambitious, but he also never forgot those who had wronged him. As you might remember, Michael Dell many years ago, in 1997, had stated that Jobs should give up on Apple completely and shut it down. And some say that Dell still has his foot in his mouth to this day. This video is long, so it might have felt like this chapter went by pretty quickly. And if it did, uh, it's because the glory days of iPod went by pretty quickly. It really didn't last, and that's not the iPod's fault. It was a fantastic device. It did one thing, and it did that one thing the best of any music player out there. But in a world where people were more and more starting to want their devices to do not just one thing, but everything, you even saw Apple somewhat adapting to this, adding features like being able to display photos and videos on the iPod, giving it more versatility than ever before. The iPod's glory days were nearing their end, but not because Apple was regressing, but instead because Apple was about to take their most crucial step forward yet in company history, and they would never have any reason to look back. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. The Mac changed the whole computer industry, and it really made computers easy to use for the first time. Uh, the iPod uh, changed the way we listen to music and changed the whole music industry. Uh, I think the iPhone may really uh, change the whole phone industry. I think this is where the world's going. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. 2007 was the beginning of the end for iPod, but the start of a whole new era of Apple. Steve Jobs came out on January 9th at the Macworld Expo to make a multitude of announcements. Apple Computer was officially now just Apple, reflecting the shift in direction as Mac was no longer their moneymaker. The first Apple TV was also unveiled, and the event didn't end there, as Jobs would announce the first ever iPhone. You can't even begin to describe how massive iPhone has turned out to be when looking back in history. This video has already ended up going on way, way longer than I ever planned it to, and so I won't take any more time here than need be. You know the story of iPhone, not the first smartphone, but the first one with a multi-touch display that was easy and intuitive to use, repeating what Apple had done with iPod only six years earlier. Enter a small market that already existed and was on the rise, but still lacking, and then blow away the competition utterly and completely. While iPhone was a major technological breakthrough and a revolutionary device, it would also end up being the demise of Apple's flagship products of the past half decade. And it's not hard to guess why, but we'll get to all that as we keep going along. After the iPhone was announced, everything else that year seemed small, and not much was changed in the iPod line until September 2007. The only even slightly noteworthy revision was the iPod Shuffle second gen receiving colors for the first time. And yet at the event in September, there would actually be yet another color change for iPod Shuffle. January 2007, the new colors had been pink, orange, green and blue in addition to the silver. And then later that year, the new colors were turquoise, lavender, mint green, and product red, with those previous colors completely discontinued. Next up on the chopping block, you had the all-new iPod Nano. The third generation was a complete redesign, not even looking like a Nano. It was short, wide, and heavier, with a larger 2-inch display at a resolution of 320 by 240. There was a new user interface, support for new iPod games, there was video playback. The battery life was supposed to last for 24 hours for audio, and then about 5 hours for video. That design is interesting. It's funny, because it's like Apple can't make up their mind when it comes to a lot of these iPods. They went back to the stainless steel backplate, but kept the aluminum front plate. And then the hold toggle got a lot smaller, kind of similar to the iPod Shuffle. And it's important to emphasize how good that screen was. It was the highest pixel density of any Apple product of all time up to this point. It had the same pixel count as the 2.5-inch display of the iPod Classic, but it was a 2-inch display, 
thus more condensed pixels. It looks really good. There was a 4GB version coming in silver, and then an 8GB version coming in silver, turquoise, mint green, black, and product red. January 2008, skipping ahead a little bit, Apple would also release a pink version of the 8GB iPod Nano. Up next, Apple hadn't yet forgotten about their flagship iPod, and two years after the fifth generation had launched, the sixth generation was unveiled. This is the first time that the iPod Classic would be referred to as iPod Classic. iPod was only six years old, but again, just shows the shift in Apple's thinking as they were emphasizing their newer, smaller, flashier, colored iPods, and of course, a certain other iPod that was coming up. The sixth generation had changed the design yet again, now having an aluminum front plate, that stainless steel back plate, and the colors silver and black. This was actually the first time there wasn't a white color for the iPod Classic. The user interface was completely overhauled, looking much more visually appealing, and probably pretty familiar to what we had with old iOS up to about iOS 6. The best thing about this UI that was starting to enter all of Apple's iPods was being able to actually see the album artwork. That was pretty darn cool. The 80 gig model would cost you 250 bucks American, and the massive 160 gig model was 349. And then last but not least for the iPod event came what would be the first for iPod, but eventually would also be the last. When we introduced the iPhone, we said it was the best iPod ever. And people have been asking us and wondering, when are we going to bring this technology to an iPod? Well, the answer to that question is we're going to do it today, and this is what the product looks like. <laughs> it's called the iPod Touch. I happen to have one right here. The iPod Touch was an iPhone, but not really. It was essentially an iPhone without the phoning capabilities. Also, no camera. The iPod Touch is thinner than the first iPhone by a good bit, and is of course designed differently, still retaining that chrome back that iPods were known for, it being actually flat here. That black plastic piece there is for the Wi-Fi antenna, and some form of that would remain on every generation of iPod Touch. On the front, you have the 3.5 inch display featuring a resolution of 320 by 480, which were the same numbers as the iPhone, but reviewers would note that the screen was lower quality and didn't get as bright. And for a device cheaper than iPhone, fair enough. Apple needed there to be some drawbacks, or most people would buy this instead of an iPhone, especially if they already had a functioning flip phone or something along those lines. And another example of this was the design from the front. You have this outer trim in black instead of the silver one iPhone had, which was intentional to try to make the device look cheaper. And it was cheaper, costing $300 for the 8 gig model, $400 for 16, and then in February, 2008 came a 32 gig model for 500. The tech specs were definitely of the time, boasting a 620 megahertz processor that was underclocked to 412 megahertz, along with 128 megabytes of RAM. It wouldn't take much for the iPod Touch to feel slow, and on its latest version of iPhone OS 3, it certainly does. The App Store wouldn't be a thing until July 10th, 2008, and so the iPod would get it in a future update, at which point the iPod Touch really began to get popular for things like mobile gaming, particularly particularly with kids who didn't need an actual phone. The iPod could be vertically or horizontally oriented thanks to the accelerometer, and that multi-touch display allowed for a whole new method of interactivity in games and applications that were never possible before on any kind of device. The iPod Touch was going to be big, it was clear from the beginning, and not even just for those who couldn't afford an iPhone, with that touchscreen being easier and more intuitive to navigate than that click wheel could ever be. Plus, with the iTunes Store on the device itself, you could buy and download music without even even plugging the iPod into a computer. I've somehow never done a full video on the first iPod Touch, and I definitely need to, but for now we're gonna keep moving on as our time is slipping away. So now we're at 2008, a transitionary year for Apple as they slowly moved their focus to iPhone, but still wanted to take advantage of the iPod's popularity for as long as possible. September 2008 got a variety of releases, and we'll start with the iPod Shuffle, which was still the second generation and changed absolutely nothing except for the colors. Again, yes, again. Again, I'm not joking and I have no idea why Apple kept doing this. I suppose they were unifying the palette to match the Nano, but it was pretty ridiculous at this point. We would see the iPod Nano fourth generation, returning to the tall and thin form factor of the second gen, but now including that large screen from 2007, just flipped vertically. This was one gorgeous device, having curved rounded edges and being lighter and thinner than ever. The colors were again different this time around, with silver, black, purple, light blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and pink, 
making for a total of nine, which has to be one of the most options for any Apple device ever made. An accelerometer was added just like on the iPhone and iPod Touch, allowing you to shuffle songs by shaking the device, as well as displaying things in portrait or landscape mode. Flipping horizontally displays the album art, for example, and video would play horizontally on that long display. Apple really pushed that display, and I think the fourth gen iPod Nano is definitely one of the most fun products Apple has ever made. It was simple, it returned to a well-loved design, and it definitely played this role as an in-between device from the iPods of old and to the new iPod Touch. Oh yes, the iPod Touch. The second generation was introduced being a lot like the first one relative to how it placed compared to the first iPhone. It was kind of a budget option to the iPhone 3G and did basically everything except phone calls and taking photos. The stainless steel backing was now kind of rounded and on the front the black trim was gone, with the screen itself being of higher quality, albeit with the same resolution as the first generation. There was now an external speaker for the first time and the battery life was improved significantly to boot. It got the shake to shuffle feature like the iPod Nano. This was a simple upgrade and the tech specs were bumped slightly, but it was mostly just more of the same. An improvement to keep the device competitive and current throughout the next year. This iPod would run up to iOS 4, whereas the original could only get to iPhone OS 3. Though the second gen is missing a few of the nicer features in iOS 4, such as multitasking. All in all, a simple, straightforward upgrade, and perhaps the best part was the price reduction. Now at 229 for 8 gigs, 299 for 16, and 399 for 32. And that's not all for 2008, folks. We had one more iPod Classic revamp, the last one Apple would ever make. Well, at least the last notable one. Very little was changed externally, though the black front plate was now gray, which I personally find looks a lot more premium. The thin 80 gig and the thick 160 gig models were replaced with a single thin 120 gig model, priced at $250. It also had audio recording capabilities and Genius. Genius had come to other iPods in 08, and it was basically an algorithm Apple set up to make new playlists. This change would never come to the 2007 iPod 6 gen, so with that small difference, the community would come to call this the iPod 7th generation. After this, there technically was one more small modification to the 7th gen. In 2009, a 160 gig model replaced the 120, but still had the thin form factor. And that would be it for the iPod Classic forever. The iPod's days were numbered, and in June 2009, the CFO of Apple, Peter Oppenheimer, which is an awesome last name, was quoted saying, we expect our traditional MP3 players to decline over time as we cannibalize ourselves with the iPod Touch and the iPhone. He knew, and Apple knew, that it was inevitable that the iPod was dying. And it made sense, with the iPhone and the iPod Touch being able to do everything an iPod can do, along with so much more, dedicated music players were making less and less sense with each passing year. Even so, iPod wasn't dead yet, and 2009 would see a few new releases. That March, Apple presented to the world the all-new iPod Shuffle. Smaller than ever before, and I mean absolutely tiny, it's like a shrunk down lighter. And because getting rid of the display just wasn't enough for Apple, it also had zero buttons. That's right, there are absolutely no buttons on this device, with only the classic shuffle toggle on the top, right by that headphone jack, which is still used to charge and sync the device. I did a video on this iPod just recently, but this thing is quite interesting and very impractical. The size was nice, but no buttons, really? How did you even use it? Well, you used it with the inline remote on the included Apple earbuds. Simple enough, I guess, but if you were to lose those earbuds, you'd be fresh out of luck. These little remotes weren't terribly common in 2009, and although they would more and more come to third-party headphones, at the beginning there, there was a good chance you'd only be able to use the ones from Apple. This iPod did introduce playlists to the shuffle for the first time, and how the heck would you even navigate that, even if you had the buttons? Well, this is where voiceover comes in, a feature that would speak aloud to you the names of the songs and artists, allowing you to navigate and do some cool things that way. You cannot speak back to it like Siri, but it's pretty cool. Overall, this was a very strange iPod, definitely the weirdest Apple would ever release by a long shot. And with that clip, it probably is the most compact iPod ever made. You could argue for some of the small square ones, but I do think this has it beat. It's a little taller, but it's so slim, and it doesn't even have buttons. Initially, it came in only black or silver with four gigabytes. And you may have noticed that clip is actually in stainless steel, the only time this would be incorporated onto an iPod shuffle. Nothing of importance concerning iPod would come up until the September event in 2009, where we got those yearly refreshes Apple seemed to be getting used to. First off, minor revision to the iPod shuffle third gen, as it was given a two gigabyte storage option, along with some colors, finally. I'm not sure what it is with Apple and making color changes in the iPod shuffle line, but we did get one in particular that was super cool and only available through Apple themselves. They made a fully stainless steel iPod shuffle, one that no doubt scratched absurdly 
easily, but it is really neat. Yet another new generation of iPod Nano was introduced, and with the 5th gen we got the same design with a few key differences. The display was even taller now, and on the back near the bottom you'll notice the integrated camera that can shoot 480p video at 30 frames per second, and there's even a microphone. Now you might ask, why did Apple add a camera? Well the correct answer is that they were perhaps competing with something like Flip Video, which were these small camcorders from around the time, and also again trying to make the Nano be this compromise between old iPods and the iPod Touch. But the more fun answer is why not? There are 15 filters even for the video, because why not, again, and the quality isn't too far off from what like an iPhone 3GS could do. A pedometer was also added to track your steps, but this is still an iPod technically, and we had some features related to that. There was now FM radio support, which is quite cool, and a built-in speaker. The colors were similar to the previous Nano, but they had a shinier, glossier finish, which I really like. And honestly, these two iPod Nanos might be my favorite designs of any iPod. It's tough to say, but they're just so fun. And it is really weird to see like a camera on one of these. It feels so foreign versus what we have today. Besides the new Nano, there of course was the introduction of the third generation iPod Touch, making the device better than ever, but still very much being lower tier compared to iPhone with no camera to be found. So yes, the iPod Nano had a camera and the iPod Touch didn't. I'm not exactly sure what Apple's thought process here was. The lowest storage option was actually 32 gigabytes here, along with the 64 gig model. Specs had been bumped up significantly across the board as the device was similar in performance to the iPhone 3GS and would get iOS support until iOS 5. Voice control was also added, which allowed you to do some very basic things by talking to the iPod, like play, pause, and so on. Now this is where things get a bit confusing because there actually was an 8 gigabyte model as well, but it wasn't actually an iPod Touch 3rd gen and also not really an iPod Touch 2nd gen either. It very closely matches the 2nd gen iPod Touch, but has a couple differences and a different model number. Practically speaking, it was basically just a 2nd gen iPod though, getting software support only to iOS 4. And I guess Apple didn't want to directly call it the previous generation in fear it would deter buyers, but it was. And that's about it for 2009. Yet another year gone by, and while iPod upgrades were slowing down, they were still going strong. But you know what they say, all good things must come to an end. And with yet another revolutionary breakthrough from Apple, it was even more clear nothing would ever be the same again. I want to go back to 1991. Apple announced and shipped its first power books. This was the first modern laptop computer. Just a few years ago in 2007, Apple reinvented the phone. Everybody uses a laptop and or a smartphone. Is there room for a third category of device in the middle? If there's gonna be a third category of device, it's gonna have to be better at these kinds of tasks than a laptop or a smartphone. Otherwise, it has no reason for being. But we think we've got something that is. And we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. I happen to have one right here. That's what it looks like. Very thin. It's just like this. For 2010, we're gonna take the biggest leap since the original iPhone. And so today, today, we're introducing iPhone 4. You've gotta see this thing in person. It is one of the most beautiful designs you've ever seen. 2010 was a big, big year for Apple, and that's honestly an understatement. iPhone was getting more and more popular as smartphones had clearly become the path of the future, and Apple was leading the way. Two major developments completely separate from iPod would take place this year. The first was announced January 27th, 2010, with Apple's second tablet, iPad. Yeah, of course we can't forget the 1993 Newton, as much as Apple might like you to, but the iPad was in another league in terms of refinement and innovation. While Jobs was proud of the iPad, I'm not even sure he quite realized how monumental it would really be in speeding up the absolutely overwhelming takeover of smart devices that we've seen in the past decade. The iPad would release April 3rd, 2010, selling 300,000 units on the first day and selling a million in the first month. They hit 3 million sales in 3 months, and that October, Jobs would announce that more iPads had been sold than Macs that fiscal quarter. Over 15 million first-gen iPads would be sold before the iPad 2's launch, an absolutely absurd number given how small the market share of tablets 
had been prior to the iPad's existence. While the iPad would be the last major new product to spawn from Jobs' reign as CEO, the second major development may have been just as impressive. The iPhone 4 announced the June 7th of 2010. Of course, today we're focused on iPod. I won't be going through much of the background of the iPhone 4, but it's an absolutely fascinating story. One I did do a pretty in-depth video about on the uh, date of its 10th anniversary, so I'll link that in the description if you're interested. But the iPhone 4 was huge, bringing not only an all-new premium design, but also the first ever retina display that absolutely blew any and all competition out of the water. The iPhone 4 was a big deal, and that's an understatement and a half. That retina display carried a much higher pixel density than any of its predecessors. There were no visible pixels. It was clean, it was crisp, and the display now felt like it was truly at your fingertips. This is when iPhone became more than just a phone, and became a device that was a necessary part of everyday life. That display was the true selling point of the iPhone 4, even with all of its other significant changes. And shifting forward to iPod, we were lucky to feel the effects of the iPhone 4's innovation immediately. On September 1st, 2010, there were three new iPods announced, with the most noteworthy standout being the all-new iPod Touch 4th generation. A design so good, it was basically just an iPhone without a SIM tray. And we will get to it, but first, the 4th generation iPod Shuffle. This would be the last generation ever made, with of course a couple of future color changes because that's what Apple does, and that's about it. The shuffle brought back the buttons in this super small square form factor, looking like the second shuffle but condensed. It's basically what is, in my opinion, the perfect design for a device like this. It still has the clip on the back, which is great, and it retained voiceover and multiple playlists from the previous generation. The colors were silver, blue, green, orange, and pink, coming in at 2 gigabytes of storage for the insanely cheap price of only $50 US. Something like this was just unheard of 10 years prior. This was without a doubt the best iPod shuffle yet, and while normally I am sad to see Apple stop refreshing their iPods, for this one, I do think it made sense. While sure they could add more storage now and quality of life features like Bluetooth and water resistance, this iPod wasn't getting any smaller than it already was without removing the buttons again, and well, Apple tried that. All in all, this was a very solid addition to the iPod lineup, and if you liked the tiny square design, then you're gonna love what's coming next. The 6th generation iPod Nano completely changed everything, scrapping all the crazy features from the previous couple generations, and most importantly, bringing a touchscreen. It only made sense Apple would eventually bring multi-touch to their iPod line beyond just the touch, as it truly was easier to use and more intuitive than the click wheel. The 6th gen Nano looks like an iPod shuffle with even a clip on the back, just with that screen instead of buttons. The display here is absolutely tiny at just 1.55 inches, showing off beautifully this iOS-like UI that isn't actually iOS. It shared some icons, but that was about it. Having basic apps like settings, music of course, photos, a radio, a clock app, which we'll get to, and not a whole lot else. You could, however, customize it a bit by choosing from the preset wallpapers and switching from large icons that fit one per page to four smaller icons per page. You could also have icons for individual playlists and cool things like that. I did a video on this iPod a good while back titled the 2010 Apple Watch, and that is exactly what this little iPod Nano would quickly become after releasing. The square form factor and clock app lent itself perfectly to slapping this thing on third-party wristbands, thus becoming what more or less was one of the first smartwatches ever made. Now, it definitely had some downsides. I actually used to use this thing myself as a watch because I was a nerd and still am, so I can attest to both its ups and downs. The biggest issue is while you can set the display to go straight to the clock when turned on, there was no way to keep it on. This was an LCD display on a very small device that was constrained by a very small battery. So even if you could, it probably wouldn't have worked to keep the screen on. So every time you want to glance at your watch, you first have to hit the power button and wait for about the half second delay before it wakes up. Of course, I would get used to this and would instinctively hit the button prior to even looking at the watch. That being said, one benefit was definitely battery life. It's a small battery, but it's not powering a lot. And if you weren't listening to music, I would find that it could last me up to a week, I think, before needing to charge it again versus my Apple Watch, which I charge every night. This thing was awesome and it was so much fun to wear around. And it was pretty great for music too with that headphone jack there. Apple actually embraced the smartwatch element and would add 16 new clock faces in 2011 through a software update, which was awesome. And there ended up being a pretty decent selection, even with some Disney licensed designs. I said that the iPod Nano 5th Gen is perhaps my favorite iPod design, but this is my favorite iPod of all time, even though I didn't really use it as an iPod much. It was so completely different and really ahead of its time, almost unintentionally so, with the actual Apple Watch.
watch not releasing until 2015. On a bit of a somber note, this event was the final one involving a new iPod that Steve Jobs himself would present, making the iPod Touch 4th generation the last big iPod release before his passing. But what an iPod it would be, bringing the brand new Retina display that iPhone had, making it the cheapest way to get your hands on it. Again, this was the best display on the market. And then with that, you also got for the first time a front and back camera system. The device managed to be even slimmer somehow, coming initially in only black, with the storage options of 8, 32, or 64 gigabytes. The 8 gig model was meant to be the budget option, but it was still very much the fourth generation, unlike the weird split they did in 2009. This was the peak of iPod Touch, in my opinion. What was still to come was better, objectively so, but it never really felt like iPod. This still had that classic design, but it was brought into the feature with the oh-so-crispy display and even Apple's own A4 chipset, the same one in the iPhone 4, albeit underclocked slightly and having less RAM. It's actually kind of a good thing it wasn't quite as powerful, though, as it's only supported through iOS 6, whereas the iPhone 4 got to iOS 7 and would massively slow down as a result. Having a camera at all was pretty awesome, and having the front camera especially was really cool considering the iPhone 4 had only just gotten it for itself that year. What wasn't so cool was the actual quality of the cameras. The rear sensor had 0.7 megapixels, and the front had 0.3. It took horrible photos, but you know what? The fact that it could take any photos at all was really the important thing to those lucky enough to have one back in the day. It only makes sense that the final classically designed iPod Touch would be the last released under Steve Jobs' reign, and on August 24th, 2011, Jobs would officially resign as Apple's CEO. It was a heartbreaking day, but his health issues had caught up with him, and he was no longer able to keep up with the duties that came with the title. But he had worked for as long as he physically could, and it's difficult not to have respect for that. On October 4th, 2011, the iPod Touch 4th generation was given the color white. At the same event, the iPhone 4S and Siri were unveiled, yet again changing the tech industry forever, as digital assistants would become more and more prevalent over the years. The following day, on October 5th, 2011, Stephen Paul Jobs passed away at the age of 56, surrounded by his family at home. His sister, Mona Simpson, said the following regarding his death. Before embarking, he looked at his sister, Patty, then a long time at his children, then at his life's partner, Laureen, and then over their shoulders past them. Steve's final words were, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. There are no words to describe the impact Jobs had on the world. His actions and continuous innovations have affected literally every single person on earth. No one is 100% immune to the presence of the internet, computers, and smartphones role in society, no matter which part of the world you live in. Jobs was difficult to work with. He was stubborn. He didn't invent. He marketed. In spite of these critiques that aren't even necessarily misconceptions, Jobs is listed as either the primary inventor or co-inventor in 346 United States patents. Over the years, he would have lots of brilliant people working with him, but there's only one single common denominator when it comes to all of the revolutionary innovations. One single unwavering person through all the constant employee turnover. Steve Jobs. He was the driving force behind Apple II, Macintosh, Pixar, iPod, iPhone, iPad. Steve Jobs was a flawed man, like any person. But there's no question, he was also one of the smartest, most brilliant visionaries the world has ever seen and ever will see. And that's a singular fact that cannot be denied in good faith. Steve Jobs thought different, and the world has never been and never will be the same because of it. Stephen Jobs helped build the first Apple computer in his garage. He is now 26 years old and is chairman of the board, and he sees his computer's future as a future of mankind. This is a 21st century bicycle that amplifies a certain intellectual ability that man has. And I think that the, uh, after this process has come to maturity, the effects that it's going to have on society are actually going to far outstrip even those that the petrochemical revolution has had. I can tell you what our goal is. Our goal is to make the best personal computers in the world and to make products we are proud to sell and would recommend to our family and friends.
Steve Jobs was gone, but Apple continued on. And as far as iPod goes, at first, a new era would start out hopeful with an influx of new iPods, modernizing the line further than ever before. On September 12th, 2012, two new iPods were announced, along with a couple other minor changes. This was two years after the last major iPod line upgrade. They were already getting a lot more scarce. The iPod Classic, of course, didn't see any changes and never again would, but it did make some sense, given the final generation had been extremely well built and didn't really need changes just for the sake of change. We would get what would be the final generation of iPod Nano, and yet again, it was a pretty drastic redesign. It returned to the long, narrow form factor, albeit smaller than ever, and it was fully touchscreen with a home button. That display was 2.5 inches, kind of looking like a mini iPod Touch, and having a very similar basic operating system to the last iPod Nano, where you could swipe around to see your basic apps that were pre-installed, and set up icons for playlists and whatnot. There was yet again basic wallpapers, a clock app, basic fitness stuff, and perhaps most importantly Bluetooth support. The first and only Nano to get it, actually the only iPod to get it besides the iPod Touch, including the iPod Classic. Apple described the iPod Nano as the thinnest iPod ever, and I would say that's accurate. Coming in the colors blue, green, yellow, red, purple, silver, and black. On the bottom of the device, we now had the lightning connector for the first time. Of course, this being 2012, the iPhone 5 came out, and that was actually the first time iPhone had the lightning connector. While this obviously modernized the device for sure, it would have been pretty annoying for people back in the day who had docking stations. Those used to be extremely popular. But besides that, it was a very solid iPod and pretty much what you would expect as like the last of the iPod Nano, just based off the Nano 5 and 4. For storage, you only had one option at 16 gigabytes. And at its core, this iPod was finally again for music and really nothing else, even with a couple basic fitness features. If you wanted more, the iPod Touch existed. And if you wanted less, there was the shuffle. Next came an absolutely massive redesign of the iPod Touch, the biggest one yet, deserting the classic stainless steel and moving to a fully aluminum rectangular body, looking actually quite similar to the all new bigger iPhone 5. We had that new four inch display, still retina, which felt so much bigger and nicer to use versus the 3.5 inches of the last half decade. Sure, compared to what we have now, it's still small, but it brought that 16 by nine ratio, which was so necessary. And the device itself was just gorgeous. Almost purely off nostalgia, I might prefer the older iPod touches, particularly the fourth gen, but I can't deny this is a very nice looking iPod. You had colors in black and slate, silver, pink, yellow, and blue, pretty standard stuff, as well as the product red that you can only buy through Apple. On the back, on the bottom left corner, there's this little silver button. That is for the iPod loop wrist strap thing. It's basically kind of like those old digital cameras that had straps on them, loops around your wrist so you don't drop it accidentally. They actually did really heavily market the camera element of this iPod. I think they were hoping people would buy it to replace their digital cameras. The camera itself was pretty darn good for the time. The rear sensor had five megapixels and could film in 1080p video. The front facing camera was actually really good for the time at 1.2 megapixels. Spec wise, we had Apple's A5 chipset and 512 megabytes of RAM. The A5 was Apple's first dual core chipset, which would result in it getting a heck of a lot of iOS updates. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that. For storage, you had 32 and 64 gigabytes, and that was it. To have a budget option, Apple kept around the iPod Touch fourth generation. It was cut to only the 16 and 32 gig options, and either still the white or black. There was also a minor revision in the iPod Shuffle fourth generation. It did come out back in 2010, of course, but because it is in fact an iPod Shuffle, and Apple loves to shuffle up the colors, there were now silver, black, green, blue, pink, yellow, and purple, matching the new iPod Nano. Reaching the end of 2012 is when this chapter really starts to move quickly. There's a reason I focused on a few years at a time in the beginning versus now. While 2012 for iPod did have a pretty strong showing in terms of changes, it would be the final year to do so. 2013 actually did see a new iPod Touch, kind of. On May 30th, Apple discontinued permanently the iPod Touch 4th Gen and introduced the iPod Touch 5th Gen, but with no eyesight camera, the eyesight camera being the rear sensor, coming in silver with a black front in 16 gigabytes, and that was it. There was still the selfie camera for FaceTime calls, but this iPod was meant to be a completely budget-oriented device, with the normal iPod Touch 5 starting at 32 gigabytes. This was a strange addition, and it undoubtedly caused some confusion and accidental sales to people who had no idea there wasn't a camera on the back. Even so, it technically was a new iPod, and it's definitely worth mentioning. I want to do a dedicated video on it at some point here, but for now, there was one more thing that happened in 2013, and it was huge. Not, not really. 
On September 10th, the black and slate iPod Touch 5th Gen was swapped to space gray to match the all-new iPhone 5S, which had dropped the black and slate due to the paint being very easy to chip and scratch. The iPad mini also had the color swapped, and the iPhone 5 was uh, discontinued altogether. This iPod Touch 5 that I have personally is space gray, and I really like it, although I've always had a soft spot for the black. I suppose you could consider something else that happened this year a bit of an upgrade for iPod, kind of, and that was iOS 7. It completely redesigned and reimagined the entire iOS experience. Love it or hate it, it was very popular at the time. Of course, the iPod Touch 5 was the only iPod that could run iOS 7, so that was definitely an appeal for anyone who had one or was thinking about getting one. Like 2013, 2014 was pretty bare for iPod. The 16 gig no eyesight iPod Touch was dropped from the lineup on June 26, only just a year after it came out. What replaced it was the normal 5th gen iPod Touch with all its colors, just in 16 gigabytes. So basically what Apple probably should have done in the first place. On September 9th, 2014, the iPod Classic was finally discontinued. If anything had showed Apple's feelings towards the line, it was this. But at the same time, it unfortunately did make some sense. I highly doubt the Classic was selling very well. I mean, if it was, Apple would have kept it around. And if it's not selling well, it's expensive to keep producing it. You have to source parts and get them manufactured, all just to keep it available. Luckily, the iPod Classic is still available on other parts of the internet, even to this day, such as eBay or a certain online store at eoe.works. This is Elite Obsolete Electronics. It's run by Austin, the man who sent me many of the iPods being shown off today, and he actually builds custom iPod classics and ships them out. It's super, super cool. And there's been an entire community that's built around these old devices. It's quite magical. So nice to see people coming together like that and genuinely just enjoying and even improving these devices that Apple left behind so long ago, adding faster and bigger storage, along with better batteries and new colors. This is a community that really became established in the past decade due to Apple seemingly forgetting there were still people who liked these old iPods. And if you're somehow still watching this, you're probably one of them. And if you are, I definitely encourage you to go check out Elite Obsolete Electronics, EOE.Works. Some pretty awesome iPods over there, like this black and orange Halloween themed device he gave me. Or if you're feeling colorful, something like this enhanced fifth generation with a rainbow colored back and transparent plastic front is pretty darn fun. 2015 would bring one of the most recent iPod updates we've seen, with an entire new generation of iPod Touch. And if I don't sound excited, it's because neither was Apple. The iPod looked basically identical from the outside to the iPod Touch 5, just without that little loop thing, bringing upgraded specs with more RAM and an underclocked A8 chipset, putting the performance about on par with the 2013 iPhone 5S. That might not sound great, but it was a massive and much needed upgrade over the iPod Touch 5, which around 2015 was absolutely struggling with performance, particularly when the iOS 9 update hit. And oh boy, iOS 9. <sighs> I've beat this subject to death across a good few videos. So I'll keep this brief. Basically, iOS 9 killed any life the 5th gen touch had left, as it's kind of just unusably slow. This happened to any iOS device with the A5 chipset, including the iPhone 4S. The CPU was technically powerful enough to run the software thanks to the dual cores, but in practice, it absolutely chugged. To mix that with the 500 112 megabytes of RAM, and you had a disaster from a device already feeling slow enough on iOS 8 and even iOS 7 to a certain extent. But luckily, it was no longer being sold, with the much faster iPod Touch 6 replacing it, even if it was otherwise pretty much identical. It did have an upgraded camera, at least. On the back, the selfie camera was the same, with 8 megapixels, about what I would expect for a device from this year. The iPhone 6 still had 8 megapixels in 2014, and this came out even before the 6S. There was no event for this, it was just a press release. It wasn't a focus for them anymore, and that's not a surprise. I'm just glad they at least gave us another one, because the 5th gen was just brutal at the end of its life. Unfortunately, one thing they didn't change was the battery. It was small in the 5th generation, but that device was so ridiculously thin and light that it was easy to forgive. But because this is identical to the 5th generation from a physical standpoint, the battery is just as small here, and because it runs even better hardware and software, it's brutal. Battery life is horrible. Just atrocious. At the same time that the 6th gen on iPod was released, the 7th gen Nano got different colors to match the 6th gen iPod, and so did the 4th generation iPod Shuffle, because as we all know, that's what Apple does. And moving to 2016, nothing happened. On July 27, 2017, the 7th generation iPod Nano was officially discontinued, as well as the 4th generation iPod Shuffle. No more colors for the Shuffle, it was gone. I'm kind of surprised Apple even kept them around as long as they did, but for better or for worse, they're gone now, and if you want one, you're 
returning to eBay. 2018, nothing happened again. And then in 2019, we have the most recent update when it comes to iPod. On May 28th, 2019, the iPod Touch 7th generation came out looking exactly the same as the iPod Touch 6 with the same colors, the same battery, the same cameras, and internal changes. The iPod Touch 7 is powered by the A10 Fusion chip, along with two gigabytes of RAM. This is about equivalent to what the iPhone 7 had. So it was quite a bit faster, and it's still supported on iOS 15 today in 2021. And that's where the iPod is now. The problem is with this seventh generation, nothing else changed. The battery is the same. It's so bad. When you first get it, it might be okay, just long enough so the person thinks, hey, cool, I'm doing all right. But then a year down the road, maybe even two years down the road, the battery degrades, and it gets to this point where you're just having to charge it constantly. But I digress. I mean, I have experience with the old sixth generation iPod Touch, so clearly I haven't gotten over the battery life, but at least we got something. You know, I, at this point, I really thought they were just going to discontinue the iPod altogether, but they didn't, and they even made it slightly better in that the storage capacity starts at 32 gigabytes, with there being 128 and then 256 after it, meaning the iPod Touch 7th generation actually had the highest storage capacity of any iPod ever made. The iPod Classic only went up to 160 gigabytes, if you remember. With custom modding, you can add more storage, but even so, officially, the iPod Touch 7 can hold the most songs of any iPod ever. And what's the future of iPod? Well, it's hard to say. The truth is, there probably isn't a future of iPod. It's been more or less replaced at this point with Apple Watch, which has a little bit of storage on it, but everyone at this point seems to stream music. It's the new thing. And with Apple Watch, with cellular, you can leave your phone at home, connect your AirPods, go out for a jog, and listen to Apple Music without the need for an iPod or any dedicated device. It's impossible to know for sure what Apple's going to do. Perhaps they discontinue the line altogether. Maybe they give the iPod Touch yet another small spec bump. What we do know is that after the October Apple event of 2021, their website has changed, making it very difficult to find the iPod Touch at all. It's still there, only accessible when you scroll to the very bottom of the page and read through all the little options. This may or may not be a sign of what's to come. Apple has surprised us many, many times before. I would love to see a new iPod Classic, something that takes the modern amenities of today, like water resistance and Bluetooth, and just makes a gorgeous, perfect iPod Classic. That's the dream. You know, people have renders on the internet of what it could look like. I highly doubt Apple does it, but there is value in the iPod name, and Apple knows that. People remember it. There's nostalgia attached to it. So I wouldn't expect Apple to forget about it completely, even if they discontinue it, but you never know. But what I do know is that the past 20 years of iPod have been absolutely mind-boggling when you consider how rapidly the technology evolved. Starting with this, a thick, chunky MP3 player with a hard drive and a wheel that spins, and eventually it turned into not this, but this iPhone. iPhone is the real evolution of iPod. The spirit of iPod lives on in iPhone. It's like Jobs said in 2007, the iPhone was the best iPod they had ever made. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this... Uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it change it improve it make your mark upon it um, I, I think that's very important and however you learn that once you learn it uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways um, once you learn that you'll never be the same again
Yeah, that's really interesting. An interesting thing about television is it always shoot, seems to shoot for the lowest common denominator.